Good morning and welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the sixth session of our archaeology and art history program. <clears throat> As I like to remind the audience, uh, the lectures presented in this series are introductory uh, lectures focusing on pre-modern to uh, modern history and societies of the region for uh, undergrads and the general uh, public. So um, as those of you who were present in the last uh, uh, seminar, in the last session, our last lecture by Dr. Faur Giaia addressed Malay manuscripts in the 19th century. And today we will remain in the Malay world with uh, Dr. Uh, Nasha Khan, um, his presentation on Malacca. However, Dr. Uh, Nasha will bring us further back into a, a much uh, earlier history of the region, into the uh, history of one of the greatest uh, polities of Southeast Asia in the 14th, 15th century onwards, with its sophisticated uh, culture, economic and political systems, and what Dr. Nasha will uh, try to uh, show us, uh, especially are the actual sources available to study this uh, 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 very interesting polity. So before I pass the floor to our uh, speaker, let me briefly introduce him. Uh, Dr. Nasha is a historical archaeologist uh, who also specializes in epigraphy and paleography. Uh, Dr. Nasha is a, a senior lecturer at University Science Malaysia, uh, precisely at the Center for Global uh, Archaeological Research. He in fact, completed his PhD in archaeology at the University of Peshawar in Pakistan, where he uh, documented and interpreted uh, Sanskrit inscriptions found in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So his MA uh, thesis um, was entitled Historiography of Old Kedah, a Socioeconomic Analysis. But uh, Dr. Nasha also published uh, widely, as you can see in the in the uh, website of the Center for Global Archaeology Research. One of the two uh, books he uh, published is uh, Hubungan Politik and Social, Socio Budaya uh, China, uh, Dunia Melayu Hingga Kurun Ke Lima Blas Masihi in English Political and Social and Socio Cultural Relations Between China and the Malay World until the 15th century. I think it's a, it's a topic quite relevant to a lot of us. And the other book, in English, uh, the translation in English would be trade relation between China and the Middle East world until the 16th century CE. So uh, today he will, um, his lecture is titled Reviewing the Sultanate of Malacca, Archaeology, History and Culture. Dr. Nasha will talk for about uh, 60 minutes and then we will have a Q&A of about 15 uh, minutes. So please stay with us. And um, so before I pass the floor, I need to um, tell the audience that please um, use the Q&A box to post your messages and um, do this quite early uh, because if we don't have enough time, the latest questions uh, do not get uh, addressed, unfortunately. So um, along the way, do please use the Q&A box and not the chat box to post your uh, questions. For technical reasons, Dr. Nasha will off his uh, video, but we will find him back at the end of his, uh, of his talk. Dr. Nasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you so much, Helen. And it is a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Archaeology and Art History of Southeast Asia program for organizing this webinar series. I believe that such program can encourage academic discourse among students, educators, and researchers. Well, Southeast Asia is known for its cultural diversity and long history. This region had witnessed the rise and fall of great civilizations and kingdoms as well as the thriving of complex cultures and societies. This colorful past had left behind countless cultural remains and historical records 
which provided insight into the history, art, and culture of the region. One important aspect on the study is regarding the role of maritime Southeast Asia in the trans-Asiatic trade and the rise of local polities which harness the benefits from the exchange of goods and cultures. The Sultanate of Malacca was one of these maritime polities and its development was the result of series of events which took place in the end of the 14th century CE. However, its emergence as a dominant maritime power at the Malay Peninsula was deeply rooted in the very history of the region, which witnessed the rise and fall of various port polities over the period of almost two millennia. During the second half of the first millennium BC, the late prehistoric riverine and coastal settlements in the Malay Peninsula began transforming into a network of separate and independent port polities. These port polities had different levels of sizes and complexities, as well as the development of hierarchies and economic specializations. By the final centuries BC, these polities have already managed to establish ties with far-reaching ports as well as to consolidate control over local resources. From the 2nd to the 14th century CE, the Malay Peninsula saw the rise of countless maritime polities. The two most dominant kingdoms in the Malay Peninsula, which thrived throughout the early historic period until the 14th century CE, were ancient Kedah and Langkasuka. The political sphere of ancient Kedah could have covered the port settlements located on the west coast of the Malay Peninsula, while Langkasuka on the east coast. Both probably existed in the form of loose confederations of ports to control and to capitalize on the movement of goods and merchandises. This makes them the first telesocratic states of the Malay Peninsula. Ancient Kedah and Langkasuka had their main ports located in the Bujang Valley and Yarang, respectively. Their roles as the population, economic, and political centers in the Malay Peninsula is attested by the large archaeological findings found in both sites. So, these are the findings found in Yarang, which was the center of Langkasuka. Survey and excavation revealed the remains of Hindu and Buddhist shrines and sculptures, as well as trade wares dated from the 5th century CE. However, historical records uh, trace the existence of Langkasuka from the 2nd century CE. The archaeological findings in the Bujang Valley, on the other hand, consisted of iron smelting sites, remains of Hindu Buddhist shrines, inscriptions, and sculptures, as well as large number of bits and trade wares. These remains showed that the area functioned as the center for trade and industry for at least seven centuries. By the end of the 14th century CE, the economic dominance of both Langkasuka and ancient Kedah finally ended. Barely several decades after their decline, Malacca started to emerge as a new maritime power located far to the south. The Sultanate of Malacca can be defined as a collection of various coastal polities. Its economic and political center was situated at the tributary of the Malacca River. It is strategically positioned at the narrowest point of the Strait of Malacca, enabling the ruler to exert total control over sea traffic, and sometimes even took over the trading vessel to harbor at their port city. The Sultanate of Malacca was by no means the first maritime state to thrive in the Malay Peninsula. As mentioned earlier, 
ancient Kedah and Langkah Suka remain as the most dominant port in the Malay Peninsula for almost 1,000 years, while Malacca only become an economic and political center for barely a century. The Sultanate of Malacca is often considered as the benchmark for the peak of Malay cultural, political, and economic achievement. Such importance was due to the abundance of historical sources on Malacca as compared to its predecessor, ancient Kedah and Langkasuka to the north. For ancient Kedah and Langkasuka, historical accounts which can give complete insight into its society is extremely scarce. The numerous archaeological findings which were found in Bujang Valley and Yarang, which I've shown just now, could only give information regarding their religion, trade, and industry. On the contrary from Malacca, the various Malay, Chinese, and Portuguese accounts gave detailed descriptions regarding the court customs, the political and uh, administrative system, as well as the names and genealogy of rulers and nobles. In addition, and most importantly, the information regarding important events such as war and conquest, arrival of foreign ambassadors and court intrigues were described in detail by the various sources. In many cases, information from different sources show consistencies with one another. Thus, historical data had enabled researchers to fully reconstruct the society and present the story in a form of a well-developed narrative which can be understood by all. So, despite of the importance of Malacca to Malay history, archaeology remains coming from the Sultanate period hardly comes by as most of the archaeological findings are from the colonial period. The lack of material remains from the Sultanate period was due to several factors. Firstly, the port of Malacca was situated in a highly populated region, which was successfully occupied by different powers, such as the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the English. The city landscape was continuously dismantled and rebuilt by them, and this often wiped out the traces of the previous occupiers. Secondly, Malacca had a short period of development as compared to its predecessors, and as a result, the accumulated cultural remains could have been relatively small. Thirdly, the material culture was mostly based on perishable materials, which could not have lasted for more than two centuries. However, archaeological remains related to Malacca are not totally absent. In some very rare cases, presence of cultural remains by random findings were reported, and they mostly consisted of coins, ceramics, and burial remains. These are the examples of the findings that we have. You know, we have the coins, we have also the findings of ceramics which can be dated from the Ming Dynasty. And this is the gravestone of Sultan Mansur Shah. And this is the one among the burial remains found uh, near to the Efa Musa fort during an excavation. For this presentation, I will be reviewing three main aspects in the study on the Sultanate of Malacca. Number one, I will discuss the different historical sources which had been the point of departure of all arguments regarding what we know about Malacca. Secondly, I will present how the, Sultan the Sultanate of Malacca was founded and how it expanded over time. And finally, I will describe in detail regarding the population, form of administration, and trade.
almost everything, and I mean everything, which is known about the pre-conquest period of Malacca are exclusively based on historical records only. They consisted of Chinese, Portuguese, and Malay accounts. The Chinese records came from the period of the Ming Dynasty. They consisted of Ming Dynastic history, also known as the Ming Shi Lu, travel accounts, as well as other miscellaneous documents. These records are written by court officials, political missions, and travelers, which provided first-hand contemporary accounts about Malacca. As for the Portuguese accounts, they consisted of books, reports, and letters by Portuguese cartographers, sailors, and bureaucrats. These documents were produced by Portuguese either through their own observation or based on their contacts with traders and locals in Malacca. But the most important and earliest among them are the records of Duarte Barbosa and Tomé Piresh. Finally, the Malay traditional accounts, such as Salalatus Salalatin, was compiled in the mid 16th century, just several decades after the fall of Malacca. It provides local accounts of Malacca history as remembered by the Malays through their oral traditions. The Ming Shi Lu, or the Ming Dynastic History, is a collection of records of events happening in the Ming court, compared by bureaucrats after the death of each emperor. In the Ming Shi Lu, differences on Southeast Asian polities were recorded, especially concerning their envoys arriving at Chinese court or Chinese envoy returning to the court from Southeast Asia. This source is so far the earliest reference to Malacca in any written account, where Malacca was first mentioned in the year 1403. Malacca was recorded for more than 100 times throughout the 15th to the 16th century CE. This suggests the importance of Malacca to the Chinese interests in Southeast Asia. Unlike any other sources known to us, one of the most important characteristics of the Ming Shi Lu is that every recorded event is meticulously dated. In addition, the name of the Malaccan kings, nobles, were well recorded. The date and the list of kings enabled us to establish a detailed chronology on the important events happening in Malacca. This also provided information regarding the history of the founding of Malacca, the genealogy of the rulers alongside with the date, and the prominent figures of Malacca as well as Malacca's external relation. Aside from the official record of the Ming Dynasty, there are also private accounts written by travelers who accompanied Chinese maritime voyages to Southeast Asia. They mostly give information regarding their personal observation on the city and society. Among the information found in these records included the religious practice and customs of the Malaccans, the dressing and economic activities, as, far, as well as their form of dwellings. The Summa Oriental was written by Tomé Piresh, a Portuguese chemist who arrived in Malacca in the year 1512, shortly after the Portuguese conquest in 1511. Tomé Piresh received information and material about the history of Malacca from his conversation with merchants, travelers, and locals. The materials used to make his book made his work a valuable first-hand document about the history of Malacca. His work constituted the first European account on Malay archipelago and the most extensive Portuguese description on Southeast Asia. The sixth book of Summa Oriental gave detailed description regarding the founding of Malacca, the genealogy of the rulers, 
and the expansion of its territories, foreign relations and trade. This book enabled, enabled us to study the form of administration and jurisprudence of Malacca, the role of nobles, royal succession, as well as local justices and law. And all this information can be compared with the description given in the Malay text. Another source is by Duarte Barbosa, who wrote a Portuguese travel literature. He completed the book entitled O Livro de Duarte Barbosa, which means the book of Duarte Barbosa, in the year 1516. This book contains detailed accounts of foreign countries and cultures in India, China, and Southeast Asia. He dedicated a special part in his book in describing Malacca, especially regarding the society, the beliefs, the economy of Malacca. Among the descriptions included the relation between Malacca, Pahang, Kedah, and Siam. In his work, he had given considerable focus on the type of local dwellings and ships in Malacca, the goods and commodities being traded, the prominence of Islam, as well as the presence of Muslims and Japanese traders in the Malaccan port. Aside from Tome Piresh and Duarte Barbosa, there are also other Portuguese records which give important information regarding the city layout and the geography of the area. However, these records are mostly written several decades after the Portuguese conquest of Malacca. The Salalatu Salalatin or Sejarah Melayu was compiled in the 16th century, several decades after the fall of Malacca. It gave detailed description on Malacca regarding the genealogy of the rulers, the court customs, foreign relations, administration, jurisprudence, as well as conquest and other important events. Over the period of several centuries from the time it was being compiled, the manuscript was copied many, many times and in the process leading to the existence of many versions. However, the historicity needs to be dealt with caution, and there is a need to cross-refer the information from this text with other foreign accounts. The source gives us insights into the events happening in Malacca, the cultural landscape, as well as the worldview of the Malaccans. Other than Salalatu Salalatin, we also have other sources which contributed to the study of Malacca, included including Hikayat Hang Tuah and Bustanu Salatin. The Chinese, Portuguese, and Malay sources pro provided three separate strands of narratives from different point of views regarding the history of Malacca. The cross references between these sources can give reliable information regarding the chronology territorial expansion, population, and administration of this maritime state. So, as a telesocratic state, the survival of Malacca depended heavily on its ability to extract as much wealth as possible from the maritime trade. Such wealth could be generated by controlling the movement and distribution of commodities, as well as monopolizing the trade of certain goods which are high in demand. Thus, the expansion of Malacca's empire meant having strategic control over coastal settlements, potential rival ports, as well as the centers of production. However, we have to bear in mind here that strategic control does not necessarily mean direct rule through invasion. The level of political control of the capital of Malacca over subordinate group varies from direct rule by the Sultan to nominal acceptance of Malacca over lordship. 
such differences in the level of political dominance was meant to retain a network of subordinate groups with different degrees of loyalties. The expansion of Malacca's empire was aimed to control trade to the advantage of Malacca's main port, and such system was a loose confederation of a uh, loose confederation of settlements. It characterizes the political framework of most kingdoms in the Malay Peninsula, spanning from the early history period towards the colonial period. We can see this from the development of the confederation of ancient Kedah. After the fall of ancient Kedah, we have the confederation of Malacca. And after that, we have the Johoria Empire. So such policies, political system was part of our history here. Malacca had 111 years of development. And throughout this development, it can be divided into five main periodization from the founding of Malacca until its decline and dissolution. The events leading up to the founding of Malacca as a political entity was described in detail by Tomei Piresh in his book Summa Oriental. It was said that Parameswara moved his court and followers two times before finally establishing his settlement in Bertam as his kingdom, several kilometers upriver from the port of Malacca. Parameswara was initially a Majapahit vessel in Palembang who was trying to establish himself as an independent leader there. However, he was unsuccessful and was expelled from Palembang by Majapahit forces. He and his followers settled in Singapore, which was at that time under Siamese rule, Bru Pahang. This event probably happened around the year 1390. And eight days after he arrived, he killed the Siamese vessel and usurped control of Singapore and the nearby islands and territories. However, only after five years of staying in Singapore, the Siamese forces arrived and Parameswara, with his 1,000 followers, fled to Moa without a fight. In Moa, Parameswara and his followers established a settlement and made a living by fishing, agriculture, and sometimes by practicing piracy. His followers consisted of Orang Selat and Orang Bugis, who were great sellers and fighters, staunchly loyal to him. He served, they served as his personal guard and army, and this enabled him to establish some sort of government wherever he settled. When his followers sailed northwards in search of fishing grounds, they came across the Malacca River. So they went upstream and found a large and fertile as well as well irrigated land suitable for a permanent settlement, which they called that place Bertam. After that, they went back to Moa and persuaded Parameswara to move with his followers to Bertam and proclaim himself as king. By being king, his followers hoped that Parameswara can be able to elevate their status from a mere followers two nobles. And Parameswara probably could choose Malacca to be the site for his kingdom because there was a vacuum of power in the Moa Malacca area where neither the Siamese nor the Majapahit hold control. This enabled Parameswara to establish himself as a ruler there without being properly noticed by these two powers. After six years staying in Moa, Parameswara with his family and followers moved to Bertam. In Bertam, they began cultivating the land and established dwellings and palaces. Parameswara was pro proclaimed king by his followers and in turn, he appointed them to become nobles who helped him to rule his new founded kingdom. 
This event probably took place somewhere in the year 1400 or 1401 and marked the establishment of Melaka as a political entity. However, at this time, the court of Melaka was situated several kilometers upriver, while the mouth of the Melaka River, where the part of Melaka is currently situated, had not yet been populated. Okay? By the time Parameswara arrived in Bertam in the year 1400, his son and successor, Megat Iskandar Shah, was already an adult, probably in his teenage years. It was said by Tomei Piresh and somehow attested by Salalatu Salalatin that during a hunting trip, Paramit Megat Iskandar Shah found a good site for settlement at the mouth of the Black River. Megat Iskandar Shah had asked Parameswara's permission for him to establish his settlement in, at the mouth of the Black River. And Parameswara reluctantly agreed. The reluctance of Parameswara was probably due to the fact that the settlement was situated too close to the coast and was too exposed for raids and attacks. Parameswara had reason to fear for such attacks, especially by the Majapahit and the Siamese. So, Megat Iskandar Shah proceeded to move his court and build his palace at the top of the Melaka Hill, or also known as the St. Paul's Hill today. Megat Iskandar Shah developed a port and tried to populate the area by bringing in Orang Selat and people from Aru. He also managed to get rice supplies from Siam. It was probably during this time that the Ming court sent an envoy to Melaka, which is in the year 1403. However, at this time, Parameswara and the center of government still remain in Bertam. From the year 1403 until 1414, the port of Melaka slowly developed and a strong tributary relation with China was established where several envoys from China were sent and vice versa. In the year 1414, Parameswara died and Megat Iskandar Shah became king. The first move of Megat Iskandar Shah was to shift the population from the old capital of Bertam to Melaka, leaving behind only farmers to work on the land. It was only in the year 1414 that the port of Melaka really became the capital. Megat Iskandar Shah did several strategic moves to establish Malacca as a regional port. Firstly, he strengthened the tributary relation with China by going to the Ming court himself to get the recognition. At this time, Siam and Majapahit was still the two regional powers of Southeast Asia, which his father, Parameswara, got into trouble with. So, for Malacca to establish as a port, Megat Iskandar Shah must have a good relation and reconcile with the Siam and Majapahit. He started by re-establishing relation with Siam by sending a tribute, suggesting some sort of recognition of Siam of the Lordship. The purpose of this move is to secure food supply for his growing population. It is also to get political protection and to avoid any further attacks from the Siamese which may disrupt international trade. Megat Iskandar Shah also reconciliated with Majapahit, still a maritime power at that time, in order to secure more favorable trade deals to the advantage of Melaka. The region, the reign of Megat Iskandar Shah marked a period where Melaka was established as an inter-regional port. The most strategic move by Megat Iskandar Shah was to break the monopoly of Pasai located to the north of Sumatra, just opposite Penang. During the second half of the 14th, uh, the second half of the 14th century CE, Pasai was an important port in the Strait of Melaka. His newly re-established good relation with Majapahit enabled him to secure trade deals with Palembang, which was under Majapahit's rule. Through shrewd diplomacy, he slowly diverted Muslim traders away from Pasai towards Melaka. 
he probably probably offered them better deals in terms of taxations and infrastructures. He also converted to Islam and married a Pasai princess. As a result, Malacca gradually replaced Pasai as the dominant part in the Strait of Malacca by the first quarter of 15th century CE. However, at this time, Malacca was still under Siamese influence and had to send yearly tribute to Siam in the form of gold. Raja Megat Iskandar Shah was succeeded by Sri Maharaja Muhammad Shah in the year 1424, which marked the period for the consolidation of power for Malacca. Sri Maharaja also converted to Islam. Under his rule, trade at the Malacca port prospered and the wealth had increased significantly. The population had grown and Malacca became a complex urban center by this time. At this stage, there was a need for a proper administrative system and court hierarchy to run the complex government. And according to Salalatu Salaltin or Sejarah Melayu, by the time of Sri Maharaja, Malacca already had complicated court rituals, administrative system, and armed force. This has prepared Malacca for further territorial expansion, which happened in two main stages. Under the reign of Parameswara and Megat Iskandar Shah, the territories under their control was only limited in the areas between the Malacca and the Moor River. However, Sri Maharaja managed to extend Malacca's dominance over adjacent areas of Lingi, Jugra, and Klang, allowing him to have direct control over thin rich areas as well as the coastal outpost to control the sea traffic. The inclusion of Rokan, located just across uh, the, the inclusion of Rokan, The inclusion of Rokan, located just across the strait from the Malacca port, enabled him to fully control the movement of trading vessel passing through the strait. Next, at the expense of Siam, Sri Maharaja made a daring move of including Pera, Banuas, and Terengganu into his dominion. However, this expanded his network of supply chain of materials from Malacca port at the cost of severing relation with Siam and risking an attack. By the end of Sri Maharaja's, by the end of Sri Maharaja's rule, the territory controlled by Malacca had increased significantly. Its economy prospered with a proper administrative system. Malacca also had proper armed force. This has provided the strength needed for further expansion of Malacca in terms of economy and political dominance. The, ex the period of expansion and conquest of Malacca is characterized by three main aspects, which are number one, independence from Siam. Number two, territorial expansion. And number three, in intensification of trade. Sri Maharaja was briefly succeeded by Parameswara Dewa Shah, posthumously known as Raja Abu Shahid, who was in turn overthrown by his brother, Sultan Muzaffar Shah. Sultan Muzaffar Shah ascended the throne in the year 1445. At this time, Kedah, Petani, Kelantan and Pahang were still under Siamese rule, we have to bear that in mind. And the area of Batu Pahat, Singapore and Bentan were controlled by Pahang, who were in turn ruled by a Siamese appointed king. At this time, Malacca already had considerable economic and military strength so as to throw off the yoke of Siam and begin an expansionist policy at the expense of the Siamese territories in the Malay Peninsula. Sultan Muzaffar Shah began by stopping the tribute to Siam. 
and successfully repelled the subsequent attacks. He had included territories previously under the control of Pahang, such as Batu Pahat, huh? Singapore, and Bentan. This enabled Malacca to control the whole west coast of the Malay Peninsula as well as the Singapore Strait. According to Tomei Piresh, Malacca also waged war against Pahang, Kampa, Aru, and Indragiri. The conquest of Pahang was extremely vital for the survival of Malacca in order to control ports at the South China Sea and to secure the resource-rich interior of the Malay Peninsula. However, until the death of Sultan Muzaffar Shah, he was not successful in subjugating these areas. Sultan Mansur Shah succeeded Sultan Muzaffar in the year 1459, which marked the golden age of Malacca. At this time, Malacca managed to subjugate Pahang, Kampa, and Siak through military conquest. According to Salalatu Salalatin, Majapahit ceded to Sultan Muzaf Mansur Shah in Dragiri, Tungkal, Jambi, and Siantan, giving Malacca full control over most part of the Strait of Malacca and southeastern Sumatra. The relation with Siam was also re established but Malacca was no longer a sub subordinate state. Siam and Malacca become equal trading partner where Siam provided the much needed rice supply to Malacca and in return, Siam could trade in Malacca and make some profits. Such relation represent the political pragmatism at that time. Although Malacca had wrested much control over the Siamese territories in the Malay Peninsula for mutual economic benefits, they could re-establish trade. And by this time, Malacca became the main emporium for Southeast Asia, where merchants from trans trade were gathered and distributed. After the demise of Sultan Mansur Shah in the year 1477, he was succeeded by Sultan Alauddin Riyad Shah and Sultan Mahmud Shah. During their reigns, the political influence of Malacca also expanded, but at a slower rate. Under Sultan Alauddin Riyad Shah, the island of Linga became part of the confederation. Under Sultan Mahmud Shah, Kedah, Patani, and Kelantan was included. Malacca continued to play the role as the most dominant port in the Strait of Malacca until the early 16th century. Towards the end of Sultan Mahmud Shah reign, the Sultanate faced several issues which led to its eventual demise. The rampant corruption, as well as economic and port mismanagement by the Shah Bandar and other nobles led to the depleting state revenue. There were leadership crises and disunity with different factions of nobles, of nobles vying for power and wealth at the expense of the stability of the state. There was also the rise of rival ports in Java and Aceh, which could offer better deals to traders and dismantling the trade network of Malacca. Finally, the Portuguese conquest put an end to the Malacca Sultanate. After the year 1511, the port of Malacca went under Portuguese control. The breakdown of the Malaccan political and trade network created a power vacuum for emerging states to fill. By the end of the 16th century CE, the Johor Riau Empire inherited most of the Malaccan former territories. Patani, Kelantan and Kedah went back under Siamese uh, suzerainty. Aceh, took most part of northern and northwestern Sumatra. Perak, Perak, on the other hand, went under Achehini's influence and sometimes even pay, paying tribute to Siam at the same time. Information regarding the city layout of Malacca can be gathered from the accounts of Portuguese and Chinese travelers. In addition, 
Comparison is made between the old map and the present Google Earth map to determine the location of historical settlements. These sources mention that Malacca settlements, city capital, and ports covered the area from the Moa to the Lingi River, which is around 74 kilometers. The coastline consisted of several bays with inshore encourages and some small islands. The royal capital and administra administrative center were focused on the coast around the estuary of the Malacca River, which is marked in uh, red color. That, is, that was where the royal residence, grand mosque, and houses of the leading nobles were situated. They were located around Malacca Hill, the site where Megat Iskandar Shah first established his court while Parameswara was still in Batam. The main port was situated across the Malacca River from the royal capital, marked in orange color. Settlements of the traders and harbors were located to the north of the Malacca River as well as to the south of the royal capital, which is marked in purple. The marketplaces were located to the south over here, marked in yellow. According to the Portuguese accounts, uh, the population of the city center itself, which is marked in red in orange, could, is, could be estimated between 30,000 to 50,000 people. While in the whole of Blacker, the population could have been from 200,000 to 300,000 people. Most buildings were built from perishable materials, while the rest were made of bricks, lime, and earthwork. When we say bricks, uh, it could have been the laterite bricks. Huh? The storehouses were made of brick also and had underground vaults. Grand mosques were made of bricks, while several houses are made of earthworks. Different areas of the port settlements were administered by different Shah Bandars who catered to the needs of different groups of traders. Regarding the administration in Malacca, the Sultan was at the top of the hierarchy and as well as the hereditary head of government with considerable authority over most matters. Contrary to our belief, we know that the Sultan of Malacca did not have absolute power and he had to consult with the Bandahara with most matters. Huh? The Bandahara was a Grand Vizier, Chief Executive and Chief Justice and Chief Advisor to the Sultan. He was in charge of the Sultan revenue as well as managing royal marriages and successions. The Laksmana, on the other hand, was the Grand Admiral and Chief of all the uh, fleet at the sea. He serves as the King's Guard and in charge of war matters. The Temenggu, on the other hand, was the Chief Magistrate of the city and in charge of internal security affairs. All criminal cases went through him before going to the Bandahara. And finally, we have the Penghulu Bandahari, who was in charge in collecting taxes and duties, overseeing trade at the main port, as well as managing the expenses of the royal household. At the peak of the Malacca's territorial limit in the early 16th century CE, the Sultanate of Malacca covered most areas of the Malay Peninsula, Riau Lingga Islands, as well as southeastern Sumatra. However, the, difference, the different areas were administered with varying levels of political control, from direct rule by the court to a nominal recognition of overlordship by local rulers. Generally, for the further away territories were from the capital, the looser the political grip were. With the, within the Sultanate, there were five levels of political control by Malacca. <clears throat> the first level, marked in red over here, just this small dot, covers the area of Malacca Port and Administrative Center. It was ruled directly by the Sultan through his Bandahara, Temanggung, Laksmana, and Pengulu Bandahari. The second level, which is over here, marked in purple, marked in purple, eh, was ruled indirectly by the royal court through the local chieftains appointed directly by the Sultan. They were known as Penghulu or Mandulikas, who probably administrated the area according to Malaccan laws. So this area covered Lingi, 
Jugra, Sklang, Selangor, Antir, Perak. The third level, which is marked in yellow, uh, were semi-autonomous territories granted by the Sultan to the Malacan hereditary nobles to be ruled in his name. So this area included Muar, Batu Pahat, Beruas, Manjung, Rupat, Singapura, Siantan, and Bertan. Bertan is over here. The fourth level is marked in green. Huh? These are the fourth level. So they were autonomous kingdoms ruled by local kings who were subordinate to Melaka. So these people, they were free to conduct their own local affairs except in passing death sentence, which required the Sultan's approval. They also needed to send regular tributes and army when required. They include Rokan, Siak, Kampa, Indragiri, Pahang, Kelantan and Liga. So Liga is here. Nah? This is Pulau Liga. And finally, the fifth level, which is marked in orange, were independent kingdoms with nominal allegiances with Melaka. They probably had strategic partnership in trade with the Melaka port with only ceremonial ties with Melaka. So they include Kedah, Petani and Jambi. The trade in Melaka was managed by four Shah Bandars. They were port masters who managed the affairs of the traders under the supervision of Penghulu Bandahari. All traders or foreign envoys must first go to the Shah Bandar and when they come to, when they come to Melaka either with merchandise or with messages. Each Shah Bandar receive the captains of the trading vessel or foreign missions and present them to Bandahara. So the Shah Bandar levy taxes a lot them with warehouses, dispatch merchandise, and provide lodgings. The four Shabandars were responsible for the affair of the traders coming from four zones, which were probably sent to trade in a specially allotted sections at the port. So there were shops and marketplaces which the traders could also rent. For Zone 1 and Zone 2, 6% taxes was incurred to the merchandisers. And for Zone 3 and Zone 4, no tax was incurred, but the traders were expected to present gift to the Shah Bandar. This was a shrewd move to attract and encourage traders from the Malay Archipelago and Far East to bring most of their sought-after products to Blaka and sell them there instead of sending them to other rival ports such as Pede. By offering such an attractive taxation deal, coupled with peace and security of the ships and valuables with, Mal uh, ships and valuables with Malacca's control over the trade route, Malacca port could be the best port for them to visit. Seeing that almost all traders coming from the east gathered all their merchandises in Malacca, the Malacca rulers had the leverage to incur heavier taxes to the traders coming from the West. They had no choice but to trade in Malacca as they could not have obtained these commodities elsewhere, while the trade route was strictly controlled by the Malacca Navy. So that is how Malacca had generated its wealth. And these are the examples of the Eastern product which were most sought after by the Western traders. Now we come to our conclusion. Eh? The history of Malacca only constituted a small fraction of the overall Malay historical sequence, where the kingdoms of Langkasuka and ancient Kedah lasted far longer. Despite of its short period of development, Malacca became the focus in Malay historiography due to the abundance of historical sources consisting of Chinese and Portuguese texts, as well as the Malay historical accounts. Like any other telesocratic state, the expansion of Malacca happened to maintain strategic control over coastal settlements so that wealth could be generated at the main port through the interregional trade. The political system was designed to administer a port city, while their empire was structured with different level of control depending on the geostrategic position of the subordinate settlement. Traders, on the other hand, were grouped according to regions 
and tax according to their strategic interest to Blacker so as to generate as much profit as possible. Although much has already been written about Malacca, there is still room for further research, especially in the field of archaeology. Recent findings in Pulau Malacca had uncovered the potential for material remains which could enrich the narrative regarding this maritime past of Malay history. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nasha. Thank you. And I think we're <laughs> going to have uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, questions. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to, to thank you for this very clear and image and maps rich presentation on uh, you know, urban political administrative uh, history of, of Malacca, but also coming, uh, you know, going a little bit further, two million, <laughs> two million years further. Uh, uh, in history showing, you know, Kada and Lanka Suka, the general context, um, not just Kada and Lanka Suka, but also Siam, Java, etc., really showing the, the, you know, geographical challenges uh, uh, of this uh, polity, uh, showing how, you know, supplies were so important uh, uh, for such uh, uh, port cities in history. So I will take, I do have a few questions myself, but um, let's take uh, um, the questions one after the other uh, immediately, because I think we have quite a lot of it. And thank you everyone for, for um, uh, asking all these questions and for reacting uh, quickly in the uh, Q&A. So we have Harban Singh, <coughs> I'm so sorry, um, who would like to hear, um, uh, uh, on the weaknesses of the Malacca Sultanate. So this is a very general question. Uh, would you like to take this one first? There's another question. Maybe I would. I, I will ask now. Would you like to comment on the current hot topic of Kota Glangi in Johor, uh, the uh, Hindu Buddhist uh, uh, Kota Glangi in Johor related to Sriwijaya Empire? Would you like to take these two first, or yes, yes, of course, of course. Well, uh, the weakness of Malaccan uh, Empire or Malaccan Kingdom, it is in terms of its economy, Helen. First of all, Malacca was too dependent on trade and it does not have an industry of its own. That is the thing which led to its demise. Because uh, as compared to ancient Kedah, it was not dependent on trade by itself. Uh, Kedah was known to be a producer of iron. So even if the trade link was disrupted, so they could still sell their own product. So the fall of Malacca was due to its over-dependence of international trade. So when there was some political problems in China or India in the big markets, so they won't be having any income. So it was economy. It was the over dependent on trade. And uh, regarding Kota Gelagi, well, uh, the issue regarding Gelagi has been going on for many decades already. And uh, actually there was really nothing over there. We know that there were some certain caves over there and there were remains of prehistoric settlements dating from the Hobbinian period. Okay, we have stone tools over there. But when we speak of large monuments, I don't think so. Most of the photos that we have, they consisted of natural stones, natural boulders. So there was really no uh, proof for the existence of big monuments in Kota Kogi. Thank you, Nasha. Um, so we have uh, Hyongmi, I'm happy to see that we have um, a very, uh, uh, you know, we have followers uh, from the first uh, session. Um, what was the main industry of Lanka Suka? I believe you have uh, addressed this already, uh, Nasha, but so what was, maybe you want to repeat this, what was the main industry of Lanka Suka and what was, uh, what were the main commodities of Malacca? Well, uh, as far as the industry in Lanka Suka, we are not quite sure because we don't have such findings yet. However, we know that Lanka Suka is connected to ancient Kedah through a trans-peninsula route, which connects through the Muda River with the Yarang River. And in a Muda River, along the Muda River, there were several iron smelting sites we, we have just uh, discovered. And in Lanka Suka, we found traces of iron slags. Okay. So right now we need to do some analysis to see if the mineral content of the iron slags discovered in Lankasuka is similar with ancient Kedah. 
So if we can be able to establish the chemical similarity, then we can say that Langka Suka probably had iron industry there also. You know, but we need to study that. We need to analyze the chemical content first. Yeah. And uh, what is the second question, Heather? Um, so uh, the um, the activities of uh, uh, Malacca. The um, sorry, hold on. Uh, the second question was what was the main commodities? Sorry, of Malacca. Ah, okay. Because Malacca did not have its own commodity. But through its control over Klang and Pera, it could have been deemed. Uh, uh, because the first stage of the expansion of Melaka was to control Linggi, Klang, Selangor, Beruas, and Pera. So those are the tin rich areas. So uh, Melaka could have produced tin in the form of raw, uh, raw mineral to sell to the Muslim traders. And that's about it. So Melaka did not produce any of its own uh, commodities. And that was the, the reason led to the demise of Malacca because the lack of its own industry. Great. Okay. Um, so a question now from uh, Jeffrey Pakyam. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, how much do we know about how Malacca's population was provisioned since the 15th century? And do you have any recommended readings? We don't because we base our knowledge regarding the population of Malacca based on the Portuguese text. And the Portuguese text was dated towards the end of the Malaccan uh, period. It was somewhere in the year 1509 when the Portuguese first arrived. Some of the travelers, they took note regarding the population of Malacca. But how the population was provisioned, we are not quite sure. But probably with Malacca used uh, imported foodstuff to support the population because there was no agriculture in Malacca, no big scale agriculture. So Malacca had to depend on uh, imported food. So that's why once trade was disrupted, that spelled an end to Malacca. It was too dependent on imported foodstuff. Do you have any recommended readings on, on this specific uh, topic, Nasha? Yes, uh, well, there are many books about Malacca, especially by Muhammad Yusuf Hashim regarding the Sultanate of Malacca. You know, that is the best book for, for beginners, I think. Okay, on this, on this specific uh, topic of, of uh, commodities, uh, Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, that book uh, did some, uh, made some analysis on this matter, but of course, more research is needed. Yeah? More research yeah. needed on this topic. Sure, sure. From Tengku Hilda, Tengku Ahmad, uh, regarding Pax Ming, did Ming China uh, enforce the military armada in Malacca as part of its tributary system and assisting Malacca as China's vessel, vassal to expel the Portuguese, which had destroyed Malacca completely? No, they did not. Uh, the Ming dynasty did, I uh, mean, the, the, the Ming emperor did produce some edicts to tell the neighboring kingdoms to help Melaka with this Portuguese invasion, but they were not in the position to coerce this, uh, the edict. Yeah? So they just issued an order, but not more than that. At that time, the Ming dynasty had their own problems, so they were not able to help a distant uh, country, country like Melaka in terms of the military, uh, military campaign. Okay. So another from uh, Hyung Mi Kim again, how could they uh, connect, so how could historians connect, I guess, uh, Trungganu with other uh, regions, oh sorry, how could Trungganu connect <clears throat> with other regions, uh, was it by ship or by land? Uh, when uh, Malacca first took Trungganu to be part of the confederation, Pahang was not part of Malacca yet. So it seems to be separated by a large distance, but we have to bear in mind regarding the political structure of Malacca. It was not a centralized state, but it was a confederation, simply an alliance of different port settlements with different terms. So probably at, at the earlier stage, Trungganu was more like a trading partner to Malacca, but with a lower position, where the people from Trungganu had to put all their commodities in Malacca to be traded. It is in terms of the monopoly of trade, but not necessarily on administration. No? It was a, a, a trading monopoly. So the Malaccan does not necessarily have to administer Trungganu politically. The control could have been in terms of uh, the, uh, the monopoly of goods and merchandises. So when we say that Trungganu become part of the Malaccan confederation, it could mean that the Trungganu had to send all their products to Malacca to be traded. And it is going to be a win-win situation where they could earn more profit by selling the products there. Fantastic. So yep. I see a f I see a few um, comments in the in the chat box uh, for uh, recommended readings. Um, 
we will send recommended readings. Um, those will be available uh, soon. Um, in the uh, so so recordings will be available um, on the Tomasic History Research Center uh, website, and uh, those uh, readings, recommended readings, will be also av available then. So uh, please. Uh, consult the uh, the website um, in the coming in the coming uh, weeks. So we have a question from uh, Shinat. Shinat, hi Shinat. Are there any research developments in finding the position of the Flor de la Mar shipwreck? Not that I know of. No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Ulrika Mortimer Schutz. Um, how long did the Parak Sultanate Sultanate last? The Perak Sultanate lasted until today. <laughs> so, uh, of course, there is a change of dynasty somewhere in the early uh, 17th century where the line, the, the, the dynasty of Melaika was broken. Okay, But the, the Perak Sultanate lasted until today. And some believe that the royal regalia originated from Melaika. But, of course, it is a subject to scrutiny. Great. Jeff Ko, hi Jeff. Um, what do the sources tell us about Parameswara's origins? Well, uh, okay. okay. The, the sure only that. source, the only source which mentioned about Parameswara is in fact by Tomei Perez and Sumer Orantel. Okay. The Chinese source mentioned Parameswara only by name, and it was mentioned that Parameswara went to China to send tribute. But the origin of Parameswara was only mentioned by the Portuguese text. I have to be clear on this. And the Portuguese said that the Parameswara was a Palembang governor of Majapahit who married the daughter of the Majapahit king. So uh, he was somewhere from Palembang, okay? And he was uh, he was driven out by, from Palembang by the Majapahit forces and uh, established his kingdom just like I presented just now. Right, indeed. Okay, so you did answer um, where he came from. Uh, Jeff uh, wants to know, what about his followers? Do we have any uh, information on that? Yeah. And what yes, 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 <clears throat> Okay, so so their followers cons consisted of the orang laut or orang selat, and uh, we of course we don't have any records about their language. But ethnographical study shows that they they speak the Austronesian language, uh, the the language of the orang laut and orang selat. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. From Madi, uh, are there any remains of the ancient storehouses? In Malacca, no, I guess. No, they, 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 uh, I, I don't expect to find any remains because you see, just like I've explained earlier, uh, Malacca was continuously occupied by the Portuguese, by the Dutch, and by the, by the British. And when whenever the a new power comes to Malacca, they are going to change the landscape, they are going to build new stuff, they are going to change, all, they are going to demolish the buildings. So we don't expect to find anything uh, related to the Sultanic period except for materials. Uh, which were sunk in under the sea, maybe shipwrecks. That is possible, you know. But for building structures, I don't think so. The Portuguese did leave a few drawings, right? Even if sketchy. Yeah, uh, yeah, they did leave yeah. some drawings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Wei Xian Wan, uh, what are the indicators of Malacca influence, control, or ownership of territory? In other words, how do we discern the boundaries of the empire? We can't. Example for, for the ancient Romans, this is an example mm -hmm. he gives. There's um, no such one. boundaries. Okay. There's no such boundary for Malacca because Malacca was not a centralized state. It is simply a confederation of kingdoms, a confederation of polities with different levels of controls. Okay? And these polities, which were under the Malacca framework, were administered autonomously by the local uh, rulers and they were only engaged with Malacca once a year in sending their products. That's it. So Malacca did not have direct control over most of these uh, subordinate settlements. So there is no such boundaries when it comes to maritime state because it is a very loose confederation, unlike the kind of uh, political structure that we know today. Yeah, right. So um, I think the question was also about um, you know, symbolical uh, boundaries such as buildings, altar monuments, etc. Did the uh, Malacca Sultanate not have any of those? No, no, we, we don't have that kind of stuff because okay. it is a purely maritime state and the only purpose for the expansion of political influence is to generate as much wealth as, uh, as possible in the main port. That is the purpose of the expansion of the Malacca Empire. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So Ulrika, um, again, can you please give more detail on the traded products list? Uh, yes, of course, there are lots of trading products. In fact, uh, we can read that in the book of Duarte Barbosa and Tom and Piresh. There was a large range of products, hundreds of them. So I can share the documents if you want to, but there are lots of them. Yeah. Great. Amir Monshi, um, let's go a little bit quicker because we have only five minutes less for uh, quite a lot of questions. Um, how about archaeological development regarding the tomb of Malacca sultans? Uh, did we find other tomb? How about Param Parameswara's tomb and other sultans? I, was, I wasn't very sure about a Parameswara's tomb. You know, there, there are several locations which was, uh, I mean, alleged to be, to be the tombs of Parameswara, but there's no way of being sure. And besides, we know that during the Portuguese conquest, most of the structural remains related to Malacca were demolished, of which the material were used to build the Efa Musa fort. So it is very difficult for us to determine, to pinpoint the real location of the tombs and to determine the authenticity of the tombs, you know. So I don't find it to be uh, easy for us to study those things. I think focus should be given regarding the history of Malacca for based on what we know. So we are not quite sure about all these things. Yeah. Okay, another question uh, about uh, food stuff and, and, and supplies. Uh, besides Siam, uh, where did uh, Malacca source its food stuff? From Java. Yeah, so, so one of the most important supply of rice is from Java. And also Malacca got the supply of uh, dried fish from Siam. Dried but, fish but, from Siam, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, so, so Siam, so, Java and Siam. Yeah, so, so no need for, you know, long distance uh, food trade beyond Southeast Asia, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Saida uh, Rastam, the new um, MWES reclamation project spans 33 kilometer between Northeast, Northern Malacca near, uh, near Udang and Southern Malacca in Umbai. How, in your view, might this impact future archaeological work on Malacca? Thanks, Saida. Yeah, uh, that area is known to be a very busy street in those days. You know, there were lots of ships. And the harbour of Malacca was not limited only to the areas around the Malacca River. It, expand, uh, it extended from the Lingi River down to the Moa River. So it could have been a very busy sea traffic. And there were potentials for uh, shipwrecks being buried underneath that area. So of course, such reclamation can affect uh, future research on, on on the study of underwater archaeology certainly it would affect. Mm. Mm -hmm. So another one from from you, Lloyd, on underwater archaeology. Um, what has underwater and maritime archaeology yielded as information tri to triangulate the large scale network shared? Uh, not much has been done on underwater archaeology in Malacca, actually. And most of the shit wrecks that we were found were found quite inland, you know, because of the changes of uh, coastline. But we have made some discovery, recent discovery of a shit wreck located in Pulau Melaka. But of course, more research in the future is needed for, for the study of underwater archaeology in Melaka. But... Well, what, what are the main uh, um, uh, issues with underwater archaeology in Malacca? I mean, there are so many shipwrecks, I guess, there. Yes, yes. the problem is because of the, the, the water color is very unpredictable. And also, uh, and in near the, the blacker coastline, there were too, too much mud. You know, it is very muddy and very hard to determine the locations of the shipwrecks. So it's quite a difficult task to study them. Okay. So a question from uh, Amir Munshi again uh, about uh, Bukit Malacca or St. Paul Hill, uh, which is a center for Malacca Kingdom, where some said the Palaka and Grand Mosque located. Oh, okay. So where uh, would the Palaka and Grand Mosque look, were located? Did well, we find uh, Okay, uh, based on the Portuguese text, uh, we know that the Grand Mosque, uh, the, the, the palaces especially, was not a single building, but it is a complex of building. So it could have been located at the top of the uh, St. Paul's Hill and all along the, the uh, all along the hill also, all around the hill. So it is not just at the top of the uh, like a hill. And as for the Grand Mosque, it could have been seated somewhere near uh, to the bastion of uh, bastion of this Efa Musa fort. Uh, Efa Musa, Efa Musa fort yeah? But of, uh, we can base this based on the Portuguese uh, maps, but there is no way of being sure until we can do a proper excavation of the area. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so we're going to skip a few questions because only one minute is left. Uh, another question of, on maritime archaeology. Um, let's take um, let's take Matthew's uh, other question. How did the lack of its own industry lead to the fall of the Sultan Sultanate of Malacca? Uh, what was the question again? Um, how did the lack of industry lead to the fall of the Sultanate of Malacca? Well, uh, not just the lack of industry, there are many factors which led to the fall of Malacca, but I believe that in whichever empire, economy is the main reason for the rise and fall of any empire. So there were multiple factors for the decline of Malacca, probably the disruption of international trade, the disruption of trade network. And during the disruption, the income of the Malacca empire was reduced. And Malacca did not have any backup to support or to, to supplement the income. And when there is no enough state revenue, then all other problems follows. Uh, I always base the rise and fall of it of, of dynasty based on economy. Economy is the how they say is the main thing which determines the the rise or fall of any any kingdoms. Great, great. Um, Nasha, uh, thank you so much. I think we're going to uh, end our session here. We've reached the 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 end of the um of the um of the seminar um thank you again so much for this very clear uh very well uh, um you know illustrated uh with 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 important maps um very elaborate maps i think very clear uh presentation and uh please follow us um uh on uh the 5th of october will be our next seminar um, it will, the title will be Indianization and Indian, Indigenization of Southeast Asian Hindu and Buddhist Architecture uh, by um, Ajahn Chotima. Please stay with us then. Uh, that will be 10 a.m. Singapore time again. Um, much apologies for all the questions that could not be answered. I told you <laughs> the early answers get uh, answer, uh, get uh, the early questions get answered. Thank you so much. I think you can find a lot of answers in on the website um, on Dr. Nasha's uh, uh, web page. So thank you again very much. Uh, please stay with us for the for our next uh, webinar, the number seven, with Dr. Um, Chotima from Thailand. Nasha, thank you again very much for, for this very clear, very interesting, um, complete presentation on, on Malacca's history. Thank you the again, everyone. Welcome.